Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Hello, everyone. Good evening. It's nice to see some folks back from Halls and uh, wherever else you've been this summer. School starts this week, so we're nice into a nice routine. Um, I hope everyone has got the letter now for the 1st of October. Um, it is going to be a really important time for us to share with you things that um, we think are important. It was funny, I was thinking today about how um, um, just looked after I've been generally in life. And um, whenever I come to speak here, um, years ago I said to Anth, how do you do this every week? <laughs> how do you do this every week and come up with something new to to do every week, and he said to me, oh, it must have been about 10 years ago, he said to me, Jen, you've just got to always wait for the word to find you. And what he, um, he's taught me to do over the years and reminded me to do over the years is don't, we can strive so much to try and work things out in our own understanding, but I do believe in a voice that speaks. I do, and there's something stirring and something... Um, come into the fore in our community that's really significant as we move forward. And so this week on Thursday, when I was still thinking, what am I going to talk about? Um, I waited for the word to find me, and it has. And I'm, I'm really trusting tonight that I'm sure there'll be uh, things that will speak to each one of you. But I know that there's specifically something that I need to speak about to some of you tonight. So in the spirit of what um, Beth was talking about, in the stillness, um, Let's just pray right now that, that whatever we each individually need to hear, that the noise will be at a quiet enough volume that we will hear it. Um, and I trust that that will be true for us all. And my title tonight is Bittersweet. And that was the word that came to me. It was my husband, actually. We were chatting about something, and he reminded me of this story. And I immediately thought, that is so brilliant, um, and I, I wanted to share it with you. And as I've, I've studied today and thought about it, this word bittersweet kept coming to mind. And the definition of bittersweet um, is both bitter and sweet to the taste. So you might have bittersweet chocolate, for example. But it's also, we talk about bittersweet experiences that are both pleasant but they're also painful and regretful at the same time. You might have seen bittersweet movies, where, yes, it's a lovely story, but there's also something um, painful about it. Um, and on the next slide, Robert, um, I, I saw this today, and it, it referred to bittersweet October. The mellow, messy, leaf-kicking, perfect pause between the opposing miseries of summer and winter, which I thought, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> that's a bit harsh. Um, and then I found this next one that I thought, I get what this is meaning, actually, because it talks about it's a bitter, sweet symphony, this life. And I thought, a symphony makes me think of everything being in harmony, an absolute beautiful music playing and um, a, an amazing sound. But we also all know in life, some stuff is bittersweet. Some things are hard, and within the sound that is the joy of life, there's also those moments that you think, yeah, I can hear it playing, and I'm hearing a harmony within it, but it's also some tough stuff. Now, then I read this. When life is sweet, say thank you and celebrate, and when life is bitter, say thank you and grow. And I thought, beautiful, not easy but a beautiful sentiment. And I started thinking about, well, what are the sort of bittersweet moments? And the ones that came to me that I thought I could think of people and situations, and they were the ones that just came into my heart, really. I love this next quote on the next slide that is too small on here for me to read. How lucky I am to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard says Winnie the Pooh. Um, I thought it was beautiful. And there are some of you in here tonight that um, I really sense a sort of feeling that sense of bittersweetness over your goodbyes. Um, goodbyes to things in your life, possibly goodbyes to people in your life. Um, and yeah, you want to be thankful for everything you are, but there's a pain to it. The other one that I was thinking about was 
Um, it's hard to wait around for something you might know might never happen, but it's harder to give up when you know it's everything you want. And some of the most bittersweet times of my life has been in the waiting. Um, and Anth did that really interesting definition the other week about contentment and acceptance. And when he gets back, I want to ask him more about it because I've not been able to stop thinking about it. He said him and Chris had had a conversation about the difference between contentment and acceptance. And acceptance um, was they'd come to a conclusion, almost an acceptance is where you go, well, that's just the way it is. That's always how it's going to be, and that's just the way it is. Nothing you can do. But a contentment says, I'm going to be okay. I am okay. I'm enjoying my life I'm in. I'm embracing it. But this isn't actually where I ultimately want to be. There's other things on my journey that I want to pioneer to and go to. And some of you are waiting around, not in a sense that you might be discontented, but that there's... Um, a calling in you, a, a drawing you for something beyond this, and you sense that, and you've got this sweet, sweet life, but you, you sense that there's a, something else for you. Um, and then the last one I was thinking about was, I, I can have lovely things going on in my life, but I am an absolute sponge for absorbing other people's problems. I always have been. And if I've got something going on in my life that's really happy, um, the amount of times I can just be so much in despair because I'm sad for someone else. And the, the warning, if you put that next slide up for me, I put a warning sign on that because actually that sounds like I'm really lovely and that's really virtuous. But there's a real danger if you're like me and you live like that, wanting to constantly make everybody else feel better, that um, it becomes not a virtue. It becomes something that actually can be rooted in pride, really. It can be rooted in, I've got to fix it. I've got to make everything better. The world needs me. And if I don't carry all this and everything on my shoulders to the point where I'm breaking my back, then I'm not being enough. So there's also times in which in life it's important to to not get so drowned in what's happening to everybody else that we don't um, smell the roses and the sweetness that is around us and be grateful. Now, two things I want to think about, well, three things really, I want to think about being bitten, being bitter, and being better. I was going to call my title, Bitten, Better, Bitten, Bitter, Better, but I can't say it. Bitten, Bitter, Better. Um, now, look at these two images here. One of them reminds me of Phoebe, I don't know why. She, I, I thought of little Phoebe on that right hand side. I don't know why. Um, now, with, there's times in life when we can feel bitten. And I want to just look at a little bit of a story about how this happens. And, uh, and similarly, I want to look at a little story about how we can also feel bitter. And then I want to go on to, Robert, this idea that somehow or other we can move from being bitten and being bet bit bitten, bitter, to being better. And I saw this other quote that says, we're not meant to be perfect, we're meant to be whole. And there's this story in the Bible of, leper, of these 10 lepers who, if you were a leper in the society when Jesus was around, you could not integrate like everybody else in the community. You weren't allowed. And there was this one time where these 10 lepers were healed. By Jesus, they were, they were healed. They weren't lepers anymore. It meant they could go and integrate and have a life that they couldn't experience before. And it says nine of them went off and did that. And one of them, of the ten, went back and said, thank you for that experience. And what I've always found very interesting was it said, Jesus says to this man, your faith has made you whole. And there's a difference, isn't there, between being healed and somehow being whole. That within life, not everything might be perfect, but there's a sense in which you are whole. And I'm believing tonight for an experience within our bittersweet moments of somehow finding a wholeness within them to be restored into how we're meant to be. So let's look at this first story. It's about the bronze snake. You may well have seen or heard it before. Let's have a read. They traveled, um, I'll tell you who they are in a minute. They traveled from Mount Hor along the road, the, along the route to the Red Sea to go around Eden. But the people grew impatient on the way. So they spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. 
So Moses made a bronze snake, put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Now, this group of people, the Israelites, had been in incredible slavery in Egypt and treated horrendously, horrendously. And then the word had come to them through this guy, Moses, that this God was going to deliver them. And long story short, a bunch of miraculous things happened and they were delivered from this and then bought out to head off for a new land. But it took quite a long time to get to the new place. Some of that was because they kind of got in their own way. Let's be honest, we all do that. And so this story happens during this journeying when they grew impatient. And in life, when we get impatient, we tend to get ourselves in a position where we can be bitten by what's happening to us. And now look at what they do. They start speaking against God and they start speaking against Moses. And all of a sudden, the people who got them out and got them somewhere great are now the problem. They weren't the problem before, but they're suddenly now the problem. They start speaking against and they start asking these questions. Well, you've brought us out here to die. Then they start talking about how there's no bread and there's no water. But then in the next breath, they complain about the food. So if they haven't got any bread, how can they be complaining about the food? So they're not seeing things clearly. And then you've got this bit in the middle where you've got to sort of think, well, oh, somehow or other, they get bitten by these snakes. Now, you've got this bit that says, then the Lord sent venom and snakes. Now, we're not going to get into tonight whether God's this God-like God who's like, you're messing with me, oh, smite you, my people. We've talked about that before. What I want to get across to you tonight is that the overarching message of this story is that God has been doing lovely, wonderful things for them, as has Moses. The story from their point of view is a story of deliverance from somewhere really terrible to somewhere really great. But on the way, when things don't make sense, and things are really hard, and things are really tough, all of a sudden, the whole experience starts to feel like they're being bitten. Somehow or other, it's like, well, this isn't very nice. This isn't very brilliant. Somehow or another, there's a, a poisoning goes on, and they end up in this place where everything is just wrong. Now, how many times have you set off for something in life and thought, yeah, this is it, this is my answer, this is great? This is just what I've always wanted. And then somewhere along the, the line, the problems emerge, don't they? And we get impatient with not seeing what we want to be seeing and doing what we want to be doing. And there's a real um, danger that we end up in this experience where we get so bitten by these negative beliefs about things that then we actually internally die and things around us start to die. And instead of getting that rich experience, we end up in a bit of a mess. Now, the solution for them getting better was to look up to this bronze snake on a pole. Now, would that actually naturally do anything? No, they were asked to come to faith to say, look up, look up from where you are. Now, when I was thinking about this, I thought, how often do we get cynical about the journey that we're on and forget what we've been delivered to. And on the next slide today, I, I, just, I was singing this to myself today, that wonderful, amazing Grace song, Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. And some of you, and I do it too, we forget the wonderful story of grace on our lives that we are here because we've been delivered through some stuff, we've come through some stuff, we've been rescued from some stuff. And yeah, there might still be stuff now that we've got to come through and be delivered from and be rescued from, but we've got this far. We have got this far. And I was thinking about that pioneer trail um, that Chris was talking about two or three weeks ago. And those pioneers who set off because they had a really good reason from leaving where they were to go to somewhere new. And it's all very exciting. And then you get halfway down and you're thinking, well, I can't see this land I'm supposed to be going to. I can't see what's supposed to be happening. I've lost some things along the way. Um, if you just put all that next picture for me, Robert. And I thought, how isolating is that trail sometimes in life? And I'm not just talking about the things we're doing together. I'm talking about some of the things in your life some of those things you've got going on now that you feel like, well, I know I'm not where I was, 
but I'm not where I feel I'm supposed to be. And I'm somewhere on that trail, looking around me, seeing everything the same. And I'm impatient. And I want to tell you what's wrong. And I want to tell God what's wrong. And it can't possibly be right. And someone must be to blame for all this. And that's when we get into those beliefs where we're poisoning our own system and our own mind with the negatives. I read this too today. It is often the failure who is the pioneer in new lands, new undertakings, and new forms of expression. And it, you could think that's negative, but it actually isn't. How, can you, how often does any pioneer in life get it right first time? The guy who invented the light bulb, the guy who put electricity in the homes, the guy that made the telephone. They didn't one day wake up and say, I'm going to try something new. There you go, I've made a mobile. They, they had some failures along the way, but they kept searching for that journey. And some of you I know for a fact that some of you are feeling like you had a go at some stuff and it didn't work out and you've tried and it's not worked out. And now you're thinking, well, you know, that's it then. And I want to stir you again tonight to say, do you know what? Perhaps it didn't work the first time. Perhaps you hit a wall. Perhaps it feels like a failure. But give it another go. That thing that's in you that you feel is important, give it another go. And this is sort of the thing I wanted to stick with you tonight, really. That don't let failure, self-doubt, others' condemnation, the fact that you're not there yet, or the goodbyes that you've had to say, develop an against spirit in you that means that the poison will be permanent. Don't let it make you go against. Look up because there is great deliverance and there is wholeness. And as Dave said at the start, there is great hope. Some of those things happen, but if we let them bite us and we stay there, that ends up our permanent condition. So some of you tonight are being called to look up. Now in the next little story, it's about bitterness. This same group of people, I actually think this happened before that last story, but this same group of people, when they come out of Egypt and they're rescued, they, hit, they come across like the Red Sea, you know, like that massive expanse of water, yes? And the Pharaoh, the, <laughs> you're laughing at me saying that. <laughs> the Pharaoh's chasing them with his chariots. And they come to this water, and they've got people chasing behind. They've got water in front of them. And through a miracle, the water sort of parts like a pathway. I mean, that's fairly impressive. They see that. That's an incredible miracle. They then have to walk for three days and three nights, and they have, they've run out of food. They've run out of water. They're really thirsty, and they're really, really tired, as you would be. And as they're going through this desert exhausted from the adrenaline of running away and being chased and somehow walking between these walls of water, which must have been incredible. They're tired, they're hungry, they're thirsty. And then in the distance, they see something amazing. They see water. And then this is what happens. When they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Mara. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it in the water, and the water became fit to drink. Now, I'm thinking today, right, those moments in life where you think, I've waited, I've waited, I've waited. This is it. This is when it's all going to work out. This is when it's going to be fine. I'm finally going to have the answer I've been waiting for. And then you taste that thing, and it's like, no, no. This isn't it. It's almost worse than not thinking you'd found it in the first place because you've got to then deal with the absolute disappointment of it. And again, what happens? They grumble, they complain, they get stressed, they get rah, bitter, bitterly disappointed, and yet God, through Moses, gives them an answer. And the answer is a piece of wood because that fixes bitter water, doesn't it? Next time you have a drink that tastes bitter, you'll just grab the nearest piece of wood and you'll put it in your drink, because that solves everything. It was a supernatural, again, they had to come to faith on it. Now, there is a way for the bitter taste of the journey to be sweetened to sustain us. 
to sustain us. This is what I was thinking today. And I, I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that for some of you right now who are on a bitter journey, that the taste of what you're having to deal with in life Maybe not of your own choosing, just stuff happening around you that's just, you would never choose for yourself because it's hard and it just is a bitter experience. There is a, a sweetener that can come through faith to enable us to have the strength to be sustained for what we need to do next. And for some of you tonight, I, I want to say to you that there is a sweetness and um, for you and that God wants to give you and invest in, in your life to give you a sustainability for what you need to do next in the bitterness of some of what you might have, be having to face. I thought today about the bees and the honey, how a bee can sting you, but the bee makes, the bee makes honey, doesn't it? And yet it's, it could really sting you and hurt you. And when they go to the hives, they've got to put on all this protective gear because these bees could really do you some damage and yet they make this sweet thing and again that warning though is because when we feel stung that's when we can forget that part of what we're able to do is make sweetness and in life when we're feeling stung that's often when we're at our most bitter towards others um, and we forget that we're also makers of sweetness and sweetness and um, bittersweet is also a plant. Did anybody know that? I didn't know that. But I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was a plant. It's also a plant, and I just thought, isn't that a really beautiful? It's absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? It's a plant. It grows in America and in China, apparently, and maybe other places. Um, but I was reading all about this bittersweet plant today, and there's f six reasons why um, it can struggle to grow. So six reasons, maybe, why in your bitten or bitter experience, you might be struggling to see a sweetness in it. Number one, it can have too little sun. Bittersweet needs full sun. I was thinking about what Joel said last night about standing in the light. Will we stand in the light? Um, it actually needs some sun. And we have to sometimes to get some sweetness in our life, come out of the shadows and come out of the dark and let the light shine on us and let some sweetness be added. The second thing is it can be, there can be too much fertility. Interesting. If the vines are growing fast and lush, then the fertility level is too high. I thought this was fascinating. High fertility promotes fast growth at the expense of bud set. So sometimes in life we're like, why is this not happening more quickly? Can we not just get on with it? Why can't the thing just happen? And sometimes it's because for a thing to really prosper over time, you've got to go at a slower pace because that's going to ultimately mean that the thing thrives and has greater sustainability, which I thought was fascinating. There's not enough winter chill. Sometimes um, it, the bittersweet can't grow because there's not enough winter. That's quite paradoxical, isn't it? But seasonally, we need times when we were in a winter when our roots are growing down as much as we need times when we're in the spring where they're going out. And, and sometimes you might be thinking, oh, well, this is just going on forever. I feel like I'm in the dead of winter. But actually, if you're in faith and you are believing for that sweetness to come into your experience, something is still going on, and it's a necessary thing that's going on. The vines are too young. You're not to expect blooms in the first year. Sometimes we've just got to mature in some stuff, and that takes time. Improper pruning. My mum came last weekend, and I said to her, can you bring your gardening stuff? Because my garden's a mess. I hadn't done anything with it all season and everything had overgrown. So she comes, <laughs> puts on her gardening gear. She hacked my garden. I mean, she destroyed it. <laughs> she literally was like, and all she's saying to me the whole time, she's going, you've got to cut it back, you've got to cut it back. You've got to cut it back. She said, if you don't cut it back, um, if you cut it back, two more will grow in its place. And she, she took this this big black tree in the corner that was covering a multitude of sins, this tree. I was like, oh no, if you cut that back, you're going to see all that horrible stuff underneath. She was like, trust me, trust me. She cut it all back and there was this plant that I didn't even know I had that was really lovely behind all the stuff. And I think that is, it spoke to me, that is such a picture of what we do in life. We let stuff overgrow. We think, well, we're just, we're just hiding it over there. If we let someone at that stuff who knows what they're doing, some beauty comes out of it. And a late freeze. The sixth one, um, 
If you experience a late freeze or frost, after the buds have em emerged, the blooms will be killed. And this happens on occasion. And I actually thought, well, that's a bit depressing, because it's almost saying, well, sometimes the thing just doesn't work out, because stuff happens. But then I remembered about new beginnings. And sometimes if we try to grow something that hasn't worked, sometimes we have to dig it up. We have to turn the soil over. We have to plant it again and start again. Um, and so I just genuinely believe tonight that there's a sweetness that God wants to give you in the areas where you may have felt bitter or bitten about the things that you're struggling and feeling an againstness and a resistance to in your life. And a couple of weeks ago, we watched a video called Inside Out on a Wednesday night. And it's a kid's film. I actually thought the kids were in tonight, but they're not. That's fine. You'll enjoy it anyway. Um, the, it's a kid's film, and there's just this beautiful moment. And the concept of the film is there's a little girl, and she's moved, had to move away with her family because her dad's got another job, and she's had to leave her friends behind. And she struggles and finds it difficult, and she's um, really wrestling with it, how to deal with it. But the whole, um, the weird bit of the film is that we get to be inside this girl's head, and inside the girl's head, there's like a control panel, and there's all the emotions. So there's Joy, who's a bit like Jenny Flintoff. She is like you. It's true. There's Joy, um, and then there's anger and disgust and sadness and fear. And so what we do is we get to see how they're operating in her mind and how she's coping with this. But Joy and sadness went missing. So she couldn't feel either joy or either sadness. And I just want to show you a very short clip of the film as she walks through this process of trying to turn the stuff that's making her bitter into something that can be a bit sweeter for her. Thank you. Sometimes we get so locked into what we've come to believe people and life needs from us. Um, that we then get into all these beliefs and difficulties because we forgot to just come and um, humbly and openly just be honest about where we're at and get some help. Um, and so I just, I want to encourage you tonight that where you're feeling like life's just bitten you a bit and just stuff's getting you down, um, that we won't try and cover up those cracks that we won't try and be this joyful, happy person to everyone around us, that you'll come and speak and find a friend and um, be humble and open about where you're at. And we can sometimes so want to keep things how they were and in this sense of illusion and keep the joy. That that's not how you get to that sweet experience. You get to the sweet experience through the honesty and openness of actually acknowledging what's going on and then finding a way of faith. Because the bronze snake and the wood piece of wood aren't the solution. It's a symbol of what to put your faith and trust in, that there's more going on than you. And the sadness was what shed the light, actually being honest about the sadness. So I want to encourage you tonight to not resist what's going on in your life, not look to blame, not look to speak against, because that'll just leave you poisoned, but to actually let the light shine. And if you are feeling bitten, look up. Look up, be on yourself. If you're feeling bitter, then receive that, that sweetener in life that can sustain you. Um, and it's going to take faith. And if you think about the bronze snake in the, the wood, both of those things are kind of dead objects, really. But there's something happens in the process of death to life in this kingdom business. And it's about resurrection. So I'm going to pray for you to finish. And I'm going to because I, I genuinely believe that there's something can happen outside of me and outside of you that will give us the strength that we need. And if you want to connect with that, then do in your heart and let's trust together. So God, I want to thank you so much that there, there is a solution to life that goes beyond our own understanding. And I know that there are people in here tonight who feel bitten by perhaps experiences or things that they've come to believe that is making them feel drained of energy to do what they need to do, or perhaps angry and that they want to blame things. And God, tonight, I just want you to lift their eyes and that they'll be able to somehow look up and see a solution and a way out of that situation, that they won't become discouraged and disheartened on the journey. They won't look to blame or to find a way out, but God, they'll look up and they'll see hope, and they'll see life. And for people at the minute who are having to drink from some bitter water because of life and the stuff that happens in life, God, I trust today that there'll be a sweetener 
that comes into their spirit that will sustain them for the next part of the journey supernaturally into their heart right now, Lord. I thank you for something sweet, something sweet to not only encourage them, but to genuinely give them a strength to overcome and to be able to taste that you are good even in those moments of life. And just strengthen us, Lord, in, in your way as we keep on a journey. And thank you that the news is good and for the sweetness that you are and for the greatness of our community together that can look to you. Thank you. Amen. Be, be blessed abundantly. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.